All right, good afternoon. I tried to put a few more people on there, but we couldn't fit. We we're going to go to smaller and smaller font. Um, the understanding that if you're on the platform speaking, you had to be in, in dress uniform or Army service uniform. So we'll have some folks that will pop up for sure. That their names may be there, but they're not up here. So, so welcome. Um, I've had the opportunity to serve as a deputy commandant of the cyber school since its inception. So a lot of things are my fault. We'll go through some of that. Um, joining us shortly will be our new assistant commandant. So if, if you knew of Colonel Steve Dawson, he has now moved to the CCOE. He's doing special projects. Um, Colonel David Haynes, former 3rd ID uh, SEMA chief, 17 Bravo. Uh, is likely to join us late if, as he comes in. We have Sergeant Major Gira here as the branch proponent Sergeant Major. Uh, Chief Cardenas is not here right now, may pop in later. <coughs> was he in the hallway? Okay. Um, and then I have uh, Scott Smith. Dr. Smith is the director of our training branch, so all training and education fall underneath him. And I have Mr. Sean Bovey, and he is the director of our proponency branch. All the personnel things happen there. So within a schoolhouse, within a trade doc, we're branch proponency, so we take care of out of the dot mill PF, the P, we take care of the T, we take care of the L. Uh, and then we influence and do some other things. So I think I'm um, slide, we don't have a thing thing, so no, I think we got to. All right. So we just got a couple of slides. What we're going to do is we're, we're going to go to, to task, not to time. We're going to try to go through some stuff and put some information out in about 25 to 30 minutes, which leaves you with 30 to 35 minutes to ask questions. Um, all of the hard ones will go to Sergeant Major. Um, all of the easy ones will go to Sergeant Major. And we'll just sit up here and wait for the 415 happy hour. Uh, but we're going to try to hit you know kind of these broad things, how we assess individuals, um, how we are developing them, how they're being employed, so what does their career maps look like. We'll talk a little bit about that. Not a whole lot. Um, it, average military things with a little bit of a, a spin, being on the cyber side, electronic warfare side. And then we'll cap it off with retention. What's interesting is we've, we've briefed a lot of folks what we train in the schoolhouse, and it's less often now. Earlier, one of the questions was, are you're going to train all of the people those things? Absolutely. Well, what if you train everybody that and they all leave? To which we respond, well, what if we don't train anyone in anything and they all stay? So we have to prepare them for operations. And really less intuitive is we don't want everyone to stay. We pull in about 300 enlisted soldiers a year. That's our target that we're looking for. We'll probably bump up to 400 here pretty soon. And in 15, 20 years, I can't have four, you know, 400 sergeants major. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. And so we want some of those to leave. We want them to go. So we want them to go into Compo 2, Compo 3, and continue to serve. Uh, some of the folks that we get in come in Compo 2, Compo 3, doing great things. We also want them to go out to industry. We want them to do better things so it makes our defense easier. Um, and we'll talk about retention from the standpoint of so how do we keep in the ones that we want to keep in. All right, I'm not going to read through that. You can read through that, just an obligatory kind of what is our mission, what is our vision, kind of bold and audacious, um, and a little bit about what we're currently working on. So we continue to iterate our cyber warfare training with one foot on Army Cyber Command and their desire, and we can make rapid changes. We can completely rewrite our cur curriculum if we wanted to. It doesn't mean that we should do that, so we don't. So as we're doing that to maintain with Army Cyber Command and the operational force, we also have to have one foot on Cybercom, which is very prescriptive, not descriptive today, very prescriptive in what the training requirements have to be. So anything we deviate for Cyber Command can't deviate so far that we're no longer following the standards of um, U.S. Cyber Com Command. Um, we do joint partner training as well. So as that's happening and we continue to iterate it, we're also completely revamping electronic warfare training. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through how that's shifting to Fort Gordon uh, and what we're doing when we do that, but a complete revamp of the electronic warfare going from a training um, as it is, and really it's a training or for planning for electronic warfare, counter IED operations, really, in a coin environment, 
to not walking away from that, but including that in looking at what are the other skill sets that are required in large-scale combat operation against those pacing threats that are our national defense strategy. So what does that mean, and how do we change to be able to do that? So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So at this point, I'm going to get some relief, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bouvet to talk about sessions. All right, good afternoon. As uh, Mr. Boudreau mentioned, my name is Sean Beauvais. I'm the uh, director for uh, personnel proponency, um, and currently we uh, serve the cyber and electronic warfare uh, populations. I want to talk to you about accessions by cohort. I'm going to run you through the enlisted officer and warrant officer and uh, what we're doing, but I just want to give you a broad, uh, broad scope of um, uh, what, you know, what efforts we got out there recruiting our future uh, cyber professionals. I'm going to start with uh, uh, working our way down the chart with the uh, cohort where we have the uh, least amount of impact today, uh, but we're trying to get that better and better every day. So uh, two enlisted MOSs that we recruit for, uh, 17 Charlie, Cyber Operations Specialist, and the 17 uh, ECHO, Electronic Warfare Professional uh, Specialist. Uh, both of them are recruited uh, uh, both in service and off the street. And what I mean by that is uh, a majority of them will recruit from um, their living room into the U.S. Army, but we still look for uh, propensity for cyber and electronic warfare with our in-service NCOs and try to bring NCOs over from combat arms and other career management fields. Um, we have a, we don't have as much engagement uh, with the enlisted force getting uh, left of coming in the Army, uh, but we're trying to get that better and better every day. We put a uh, contract recruiting team into the proponency office about a uh, a year ago, where we're going out and we're actively partnering with USAREC, United States Army Recruiting Command, on events called uh, TEAR, Total Army Involvement in Recruiting. So we're getting out, we're going out and identifying the young um, high schoolers, uh, young um, individuals in college that haven't uh, completed a degree yet, and we're pointing them to a recruiter. Uh, they love it. Uh, we don't um, ask to take any of their quotas. We just turn them over to them, identify. Um, some of them go through MEPS, pass the required knowledge-based test, ASFAB test to meet the criteria. Some do not. Um, but we're trying to get that better and better every day. Uh, for our officers, um, we, uh, every officer that's going to branch into cyber uh, goes through an interview with the proponent team and fills out a very rigorous uh, four-page questionnaire. Uh, that questionnaire covers... Uh, topics from uh, radio frequency to computer programming uh, to mathematics to logic. Uh, we have a few aptitude type based questions on there designed to be very, very difficult, designed to uh, not score very well on. We give it in a proctored environment um, and try to keep the uh, cadets or office, in case of OCS, candidates down at officer candidate school um, uh, to a limited uh, 30 minute time limit and have them fill out as best as we can. And between interview score and um, questionnaire, we tally up those scores and we provide an OML list to the commissioning source saying, hey, of the 450 ROTC reserve officer training corps individuals we interviewed and provide a questionnaire, here's the 250 that are above the cut line. Um, please commission that we don't get 250 a year. We only get about 55 to 60 out of ROTC a year. But uh, that's what we're doing there. Um, we got 17 Delta up there as provisional. That is a capability developer officer. We're in the process of building. Um, that will be the scripters, the tool developers, Python, C++ coders. Um, that is currently at TRADOC, uh, staffing through the process. And then um, the bottom bullet up there, uh, Cyber Direct Commissioning Pilot Program, that CYDCPP. Uh, we're kind of, uh, not kind of, we are piloting that for the Army with a basic branch. So for those not familiar with direct commissioning, that's how the Army brings in uh, medical, chaplains, and lawyers. So we go out um, based off of definitive requirements from the operational force. We go out and look for exactly um, the skill sets they're looking for. Uh, these, in an ideal world, our niche skill sets that we can't, under the training environment, readily train, and we, we need to fill a gap in the operational force. Uh, to date, we have commissioned seven into the Army. 
um, over to, and this is over, we've been working this effort for about 20 months. Uh, four of them are currently serving in the operational force, have completed all their initial training, which is very limited because we hired them for a specific technical capability. And we got three more that just started the direct commissioning course down at uh, Fort Benning, uh, Georgia. Uh, we got a data scientist and uh, two software engineers that'll come up here for an abbreviated basic officer leadership course. And then we'll get those uh, three plugged into the operational force as well. Um, under warrant officers, um, the reason I got that on there last, I said I was going from least to most engaged. Uh, we probably, uh, not probably, we have the most aggressive warrant officer recruiting um, operation in the Army. Now, why is that? Is because we have the worst NCO feeder ratio to warrant officers. So to recruit the number of warrant officers, highly technically capable uh, individuals that we need, we have to recruit from across the entire Army. That includes um, recruiting existing MI signal warrant officers and converting them over to 170 Alphas or 170 Bravos. That includes identifying enlisted NCOs in other career fields that have mad computer skills that we can, uh, we, through assessment tests, we figure out can come in and pick up technical capabilities. Um, as with uh, 17 Delta, the capability developer, uh, we're also looking at building a uh, 170 Delta uh, capability development technician. And um, that uh, same thing, scripting, Python, C++. Um, the interesting thing there, through the direct commissioning program, we've identified that there's uh, talent out there in the civilian world. So we're going to model that recruiting effort after the aviation model. We're going to bring those individuals off the street like aviation recruits pilots. Um, it'll be a very, very small uh, MOS, military occupational specialty. Um, we'll only train four to six per year. And right now we're planning on capping out at about 40. We have um, approximately 22 to 24 existing 170 alphas. Is that still the number accurate? Yeah, would be converted over. Yes, that would be converted over. Okay, so we have eight 170 alphas that will convert over to 170 delta once that MOS is stood up. There's a handful more of enlisted, I'm sorry, that I'm thinking of that are doing the tool developer job that will try to pull in to become 170 deltas at all. So that, that is a quick snapshot of our sessions. Um, and then uh, what I want to talk about on this slide, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, chart up in the top left there on a further slide. But I want to talk about on the bottom right on this slide is... Um, at bottom line, cyber and electronic warfare, we're victims of our own success. So, well, you know, the rest of the Army was shrinking from 2015 to 2019. We were growing, um, and because of the mission set, the real world threat out there, uh, these numbers going forward from 2019 to 2025, we're going to continue to grow. Our officer population is going to add another 25%. Our 170 Alphas and 170 Bravos are going to grow by another uh, nine, ten percent, respectively, and then also on the um, enlisted piece, uh, heavy growth with the electronic warfare community, and if all the growth that um, headquarters Department of the Army is talking about comes to fruition, that thirty percent is going to bump up closer to uh, um, fifty percent. Um, but based off of what we know, approved growth coming today, we got about a thirty percent growth there. So it have a huge impact on the training side, which. Um, uh, Mr. Boudreau or Mr. Smith will get into uh, later on. I think that is Dr. Smith's turn. Doctor. Okay, uh, I'm Scott Smith. I'm the director of training for the cyber school. So I'm going to talk about how we've been changing training, how we've been growing training uh, over the past couple of years and kind of where we're going in the future. So uh, the very first class graduated from the cyber school back May 2016. So 16 students graduated uh, back in FY16. Uh, this year, we're looking about 1,500. Next year, about 2,500. And by, 20, by FY22, we should have about 4,000 students that are graduating. Uh, so again, uh, like, like Sean and Todd have both mentioned, so the cyber school is definitely in the growth industry. Uh, if we go back to FY16, that's kind of where our curriculum, uh, that's when we built the curriculum was back in 2016. So right now, we're undergoing uh, significant revisions across our curriculum. So if you think about 
Uh, every student, the first time they go through uh, the cyber school, everyone gets Cyber Common Technical Core, a nine-week uh, common baseline technical understanding. So we know that everyone out, everyone that's Army, Cyber Mission Force, they've all had the same technical baseline. Uh, so right now we're doing significant revisions for that class, uh, that course. Uh, it used to be uh, kind of split up among four blocks. You had a, a Windows block, a Linux block, networking and security. Uh, we really weren't doing a lot with the security piece. Uh, we recognized that was a shortfall, so now we're doing a major revision. So now instead of teaching uh, Windows and Linux separately, we're just teaching operating systems uh, because, you know, there's other operating systems out there. You could uh, continue. So it's just to really get students to think about operating systems without kind of pigeonholing them into a specific type. Uh, we're continuing to do networking, so both of those blocks are fairly well developed, and we've put a lot of effort into developing this, the security block. Uh, we've had two... Uh, pilot courses go through. What we've realized, it's a very, very difficult, very challenging block uh, that's causing a lot of struggles for them. Uh, uh, so again, we're continuing to refine that. We're continuing to you know, make sure that we're delivering uh, what's required by the operational force. Uh, in addition to those revisions, uh, we're also uh, building future training. So uh, last year, we submitted... Uh, so most, most COEs, maybe they submit one, maybe two courses for course growth. Uh, the cyber school, not the cyber SOE, but just the cyber school alone, I think we submitted 18 courses last year's growth. So uh, looking at our growth, if you take the rest of what the, the TRADOC submitted as growth, so cyber school uh, pretty much matches what the, re the other schools are submitting. So from a, from a funding standpoint, uh, they can fund the cyber school or they can fund everything else and it would be about equal. So we're, we're still in a very significant growth period right now. Uh, a big chunk of that growth I'm going to talk about here in a second is EW, but we are continuing to grow our cyber courses. Uh, so if you think about uh, specific work roles, so things like operators, EAs, DNEA, so each of those has, each of those work roles uh, has very specific training requirements, so we're starting to develop those so we're no longer having to rely on NSA and what NSA is providing. Uh, so we're looking at ways, looking at alternatives, ways that we can have uh, training that's managed, that's, uh, that, that really meets what Army Cyber is requiring, uh, not just we're not just relying on what other what other entities have developed for training, just saying hey that kind of fits for us. Uh, so we're so we're really building towards the future. Uh, we're also the joint curriculum lead. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. So uh, the way Cybercom kind of looked at training is they've they've parceled out uh, the curriculum development to each of the services. So the Army. Uh, we kind of have what's, if you think about OCO, so they call it the cyber attack roles. Uh, the Navy's got def defense, and then the Air Force has the support. So, uh, so, we, so if you look at work roles, the Army is the joint curriculum lead for operators, EAs, DNEAs, and targeteers. Uh, so what that means is the Army is responsible for making sure that there is appropriate training available. So it doesn't really say that we have to offer that training. Uh, it just says that we're responsible for making sure the training packages are developed. So that way if the Navy wants to do the operator training, we would then turn over the training packet to them, make sure their instructors are certified and ready to teach it, and then the Navy could be off and running to train their own folks on the operator work role. Uh, so as joint curriculum lead, uh, again, we're going through validation right now. So we've developed the courses. Now Cybercom has to bless off on them. So we're really undergoing a fairly rigorous validation process uh, that makes sure that all the services have bought in and they all agree that those, cl those courses that have been developed meet the training needs of each of the services. Uh, from an EW standpoint, so very exciting with EW, just this past Monday, so m Monday the 12th, uh, the very first uh, EW AIT class started here at Fort Gordon. So the first 20 students, uh, if you think about as sessions right now for EW, so before Monday, uh, pretty much if you wanted to be an EW soldier, you had been something else first. Uh, it could be anything. You spend a couple years doing whatever that job is. You could be signal. You could be quartermaster. You could do any other MOS, and then you transition over about the E5, E6 level. Uh, so now we've stood up an actual accessions MOS, so kids, when they come out of high school, they can sign up to be an EW soldier. So that way they'll spend their entire career. So if they're going to spend 20 years in the Army, they can spend all 20 years as an EW soldier. So that's really getting after... Uh, so when you have an E6 that comes, you know, if you have an E6 that shows up at your unit as EW, previously, you know, they might have come right out of school or maybe they had just one or two years. Now when you have an E6, if it took them 12 years to get to that point, then they've spent 12 years developing their EW expertise. Uh, so we're very excited about that. 
And if you look, so we're going to have uh, the, the folks who started last Monday are going to spend a little bit over 28 weeks with us. Previously, a sessions for EW was a nine-week course. So that nine-week course also counted for them uh, for their advanced leader course. So that was not only their sessions, but that was also their NCO training. Uh, now, uh, they're going to spend 28 weeks as an AIT soldier, and they're going to spend an additional 18 weeks uh, when they go through the advanced leader course, which will stand up here uh, probably next October. Uh, a year from October. So come FY21, we'll have the advanced leader course and the senior leader course both here at Fort Gordon. We're going to move SLC from Fort Sill. That's an existing course, eight-week course. It's still going to stay eight weeks. So previously, when you looked at EW NCOs, so that across their career, they got 17 weeks of training. Under the new, you know, the new training model, they're going to get over 52 weeks. So a significant upgrade. So if you just think, just from a number standpoint alone, they should know a lot more uh, but again, you know, these are very, these will be very challenging, very technically demanding courses so that we can continue to build on as they go throughout their entire career. Uh, we're also, uh, because the NCOs are going to have that additional technical training, when they become warrant officers, that really allows us to really kind of up the game for warrant officers as well. So the warrant officer training, we're going to uh, also expand the WOBIC. Uh, so that's going to go to 28 weeks as well. Uh, and then the WOAC will be 12 weeks, so they're going to get 40 weeks. Right now they get about 17 weeks as a, as a warrant officer, so they're going to get 40 weeks of training, just warrant officer training alone. So that's after they go through AIT, if they go through ALC, you know, that's in addition to all that. So again, significant growth industry, so the EW soldiers that we're producing should have a much, much higher level of technical knowledge, much greater uh, capability once they get to the force. Uh, and the officers as well. So the way the EW officers are going to work in the future is they're going to be a cyber officer first. So they're going to be a 17 alpha. They'll get assessed. They're going to go through the 17 alpha basic officer leader course, BOLIC, so 34 weeks. Uh, after they do that, before they go to their first EW assignment, they're going to go through the 13-week EW officer qualification course. So it's still 13 weeks. It's 13 weeks right now. But because they've gone through cyber BOLIC with us, it allows us to add some additional technical EW material to that 13 weeks. So because they're already getting some things when they go through 17 Alpha Bullock, that really allows us to add about three or four more weeks of EW-specific training when they go through their uh, EW officer qualification course. Uh, for future EW education training efforts, so training the force. Uh, so again, we're looking, so the soldiers that we're going to produce coming out of AIT are going to be at a higher technical level than many of the EW soldiers are out in the force right now. So we're looking at ways to get after that gap. So way, what are some ways that we can address some of these deficiencies? Uh, so we've, we've actually put together MTTs in the past. So before a unit goes to uh, National Training Center, before they deploy, we've sent out MTTs to give them uh, some technical training. Uh, and actually, we're in discussions right now. So I know General Fogarty was, but we're looking at maybe perhaps bringing those NCOs that are out there right now, maybe bringing them back and having them go back through AIT, uh, the 28-week AIT, you know, to try to get them up to speed technically. Uh, the last bullet up there is shaping that home station training environment. Uh, so we're working uh, with the Intel Center on Foundry, so uh, uh, linking in with them to make sure that the, uh, the folks that we're putting out to the force are, are able to continue training at their location. So we're partnering with Foundry to get them into classified training facilities uh, and also to get after a lot of the training that's available in those facilities. Uh, and we're also looking at what are some ways that we can develop uh, training materials and training kit. Uh, so one of the things as we stood up this EW training here at Fort Gordon is we didn't have an EW range. So uh, uh, an interim kind of a workaround initially is we've worked with White Sands Missile Range and we've come up with kind of a range in a box. So something that was mobile that we can take to different field training areas because we don't have a permanent EW range here at Fort Sill. In the future, we hope to get to that. Uh, we're still in discussions, still under development, still in design of what an EW range here at Fort Sill would look like. Uh, but in the interim, we have this range in a box. So we're also offering that out uh, to the operational force. So hopefully they can also purchase. So that way when soldiers show up, <laughs> They have something to train on because we don't want EW soldiers showing up just to become, you know, the next USR officer when they show up just because they're, they're there. Because they're smart, you know, your USR folks tend to be very smart, but, you know, they need to be doing what they're trained to do to get after, you know, the, the, this capability gap that's out there. Uh, kind of a timeline for doing that. So as I mentioned last Monday, we started up 17 Echo AIT, the very first EW course here at Fort Gordon. Uh, 
This year, this year meaning FY19, so this month we had one class start up of 20 soldiers. Next month we'll have 20 soldiers start up, so we'll put 40 AIT soldiers in FY19. Uh, next year, next FY, FY20, we'll train 120 uh, AIT soldiers here at Fort Gordon. And any Delta will continue to go through Fort Sill. So if the Army needs 250, then we do 120 AIT soldiers here. Fort Sill would train 130 through the 2-3 course. And then at the end of 20, we're going to shut down the existing 17 Echo 2-3 course at Fort Sill. And anyone, any enlisted soldier who comes in is going to go through the new 17 Echo AIT here starting in FY21. Uh, as I mentioned before, continue with the NCO, the, the uh, PME. So ALC, we're going to start up uh, ALC and SLC for 17 Echoes here, probably uh, first quarter FY21, just because that's when we think the demand is going to be there. So right now there's a demand for SLC. SLC exists at Fort Sill. But come next October is when we think we'll have graduated enough MOSTs out of the 17 Echo AIT that we're going to have a demand for ALC. Because right now when they go through the 2-3 course, they've gotten credit for ALC. But going forward, since they're going to come out of AIT, they're no longer going to get the ALC credit from 2-3. So we're going to stand up. So all by first quarter, by October of 2020, so first quarter FY21, all NCO training will be here at Fort Gordon. Uh, next summer, June of 20, we're going to move the 17 Bravo EW officer qualification course from Fort Sill and come next June, the very first class will be taught here at Fort Gordon. As we move training from Fort Sill to Fort Gordon is when we're going to implement the latest curriculum. So when I talked about how we're going to update the EW officer curriculum, when we move it here next June is when they're going to get the newer curriculum. Uh, and then the warrant officers, right now you have Wobick and Wowak out at Fort Sill. Uh, the last class of warrant officers will graduate in second quarter of FY20. And then the first class, because only, we only put in 15 to 20 warrant officers a year, so the first class we're going to run here second quarter. So January of, of 2021, so second quarter 21, we'll have warrant officer training. That will be the last two courses uh, that we stand up. So by the end of FY20, all EW training will be here at Fort Gordon. Yeah. Jump on the next slide. So for speed, let me, let me do this too. So if you see this bottom right-hand corner, that kind of describes what the, the AIT course will be. So about 363 hours of, of discussion and, and kind of understanding. Um, but then you look at 103 hours of practical exercises, so a lot of time working through problem sets. Then you see all those labs, so lots of time in a lab to actually see what's going on, to be able to look at radio waves, propagating, looking at a spectrum analyzer, and then to see what happens when you bounce waves together and so forth. And then 150 hours outside now taking kit and presenting. So it really talks about this right here, how we doing this continuum of learning. We're very focused on the operational force. We'll make continuous changes uh, based on the operational force feedback. Our desire is that we bring in AIT students, that they get a lot of technology, so they're going to learn a lot of math, a lot of physics. They're going to understand why things are actually happening. Then using those labs to become technically competent, now they understand what happens when, when they, you know, put effects in the EMS, and then get on their kit to present that out in the field environment. So now they start to go from being technically competent to being tactically competent. That's the lash up between us and the operational force. So then the goal is there at the operational force. They know exactly where we left them off, and then that thing that we forgot about for, like, the last 20 years, like sergeant's time and stuff like that. And so we'll start doing some of that, some of that training again. Uh, eventually they'll come back through here. They'll go through their PME. And so this is really continuum. And what's important is that orange underneath, you know, all those lessons learned to help deviate. And so as we see this, and I'm not going to go through all this bullets. You can read pretty quick because there's big font there. But it is a lash-up between the institution and the operation. There are some things that are the operational force's uh, responsibility, but we don't just, you know, wipe our hands and say that's up to you now. We think that we have a contributing part to make sure that that continues to go on and is developed. Um, we're anybody from industry here? I see some industry folks. So ramping up for all of that, you'll see some contracts as we're looking for instructors. Um, there's a white paper that's being put together that'll work with Forcecom to look at what does that home station EMS training range look like? How do we replicate a complicated 
a congested, contested, and a lethal EMS environment. Okay? You turn something on to jam, you're now beaconing to the adversary's targeting system. You're a communicator that, you know, using uh, omnidirectional antennas always on full blast, guess what? Uh, that may work in some environments. Uh, it doesn't work against some of the pacing threats. And so we're looking for what is that training environment that we can put our EW soldiers, our SIGINT soldiers, our signal soldiers to do the frequency management, and even squads, maneuver forces to go through. And if you turn things on and you're no, not using good emissions control, if I can see you, then I can target you and you can die. So that's the reality that we're trying to get to in large-scale combat operations. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to put this up here really quickly. Lots of growth. You heard General uh, uh, Fogarty talk about this. You'll hear General Hersey talk about this. Lots of stuff going on in this domain. And so we've got a lot of work to do. We're looking at partnerships. We do a lot of partnerships. In fact, we need to partner because, and this is probably a busy slide unless you've seen these before. It makes a lot of sense. When, you know, They say a picture tells a thousand words. Unfortunately, sometimes the first three is, what is that? You know, lots and lots of stuff. But what's important is you don't see a lot of EW standing out. You see a lot of MI standing out. EW will be entrenched within those MICOs and those EMIBs. And so having the training strategy, the training um, um, uh, qualifications they have to go through, and the training range that resonates that MICO commander so that he or she can then take their, their SIGINT individuals and their EW individuals, mix them so that they form integrated platoons and can go through all of the training that they need to to make sure that they're effective on the battlefield. Lots of integration. And I'm going to hit on the last slide. We're going to hit real quick. If Sean, if you can just talk a little bit about what we're doing to retain talent, and then I honestly want to get to your questions. That's why I went through that a little quick. Yeah, and I'll hit this quick. There's just a couple things I want to highlight on here. Hey, so what we're looking at for the cyber and electronic warfare workforce is tailored retention packages. Money's going to work for some, money's not going to work for all. So we've been working with uh, our cyber, um, and, and the challenge today, I'm very hesitant to answer, hey, how are you retaining folks? Because the folks that we brought in, no kidding, is pure cyber, none of them have reached that um, threshold yet where they've been able to re-enlist or resign their commission. We're getting pretty close. Um, we got some pretty good models from MI and Signal where we, we think we know what's going to happen. Um, but we're looking at um, multiple uh, incentives for different individuals, tailored packages. And then the other big thing for the high-end talent, um, General Fogarty and our cyber team, we've been partnering with them for the last 18 months, and they're working um, phenomenally to change Army policy. Um, though, any jumpers in here? $150 a month? Yeah, hey, $150 a month, that's cool. Might pay an electric bill, get you some beer on the weekend. Um, General Fogarty's going to Congress for assignment incentive pay to, for our high-end work roles where our master exploitation analysts, tool developers, and um, online operators can get $3,000 a month. That, I mean, life-changing money. Um, so he's, cha he's having laws changed so we can raise money up to that level. So, and then uh, basic of those three, uh, goes basic senior master, basic of those will be $1,000 a month. And then senior 2000 um, master 3000 So, I mean, that is life-changing money. So that, that is uh, um, not for all work roles, obviously, um, but we're gonna, that'll help us identify talent, put the right people into those uh, uh, work roles and work that. But General Fogarty's had some really good luck with uh, headquarters DA G1, G3, uh, moving that forward. Uh, right now, we're capped at uh, $1,500 uh, for the masters and those three work roles, but uh, we're moving towards that $3,000 threshold. Um, I, I think that'll really help with high-end retention. That and the tailored packages, we'll keep working with individuals on an individual basis to, um, you know, get them in. Um, but that's what I wanted to highlight on that. And then as Mr. Boudreau alluded to, um, we, I think next question should be, or next slide should be questions and answers so we can get to your uh, questions. Yeah, I do want to touch just one thing on this. So do, do I have any linguists? Used to be linguists, linguists in the Army. Okay, so if you, if you meet with a linguist, they have, you know, language proficiency pay. Um, and if I talk, to, I've talked to a number of them and asked them, is, is your job keeping you engaged in a way that is developing and maintaining your language skills so that when you take that proficiency test, 
you're doing the best you can? And, and the answers are normally no, maybe 30%, 40%. Well, then what are you doing to maintain your language proficiency to be able to get paid? Well, I'm subscribing to these periodicals. I watch this. I do this. That's what incentive pay is about. There's one piece that we keep talking about. We're paying people to stay in. That's not it. I mean, that's part of it, but I think that's kind of a wrong and a lopsided messaging. They're being incentivized by giving them this money so that they can invest that in themselves to be able to maintain those proficiencies. So this is when the cyber dude or cyber dudette comes into work, and they just said that their spouse is mad at them because they have no garage, because they've got air and their electricity bill is out the roof. They've had to put in extra air conditioning units to air condition their garage, and they've got extra breakers because they've got an entire lab in their garage. And that's what's making the, their skills stay where we want to keep them in. And so this incentive pay is to incentivize that, to keep doing that. The other piece that, that uh, Sean touched on a little bit is the non-monetary, and that's something that, that we've pushed for a while, that it become merit-based, so we had General Funk came down and chatted with the, the, our students today as well. And while we were walking the hallway, I said, hey, you're going to meet some young soldiers. You've met them, you know, your entire career. I hear about this current generation that mm, they, um, they want to know why they're learning something before they learn it. Um, they want to be uh, attached to something that's meaningful, that they want recognition when they earn it. And I said, sir, I came to an epiphany. I'm a millennial. I mean, who doesn't want to do that? If you challenge me, anyone play golf, go to any driving range and look for the, some of the oldest people out there. When they hit it really far and really straight, they look around and say, did anyone see that? We all want those things. And so how do we look at incentivizing through our, our non-monetary system using a merit-based system? You get more options if you have a, and this is not a people worth because everyone has worth, but we've, the Army has invested in you, and you have performed well, and that's how we want to incentivize. So we're looking at how do we shift to a more merit-based system, because they see that. I always tell them, hey, you know, because I get to talk to all the AIT students, hey, they call you the trophy generation, right? You know why? And I, saw, I see all the body language. And then I say, it's really not you. It's your parents, right? Yes, yes. So, so they want recognition when they do something well. If everyone gets it, then it's not special to them. So we're looking at how do we pivot to a merit-based system. So I promised you all that we would open up for questions now. If you have any questions about anything we briefed or anything even we didn't brief, if there's any gaps, again, hard questions are going to Sergeant Major. So what are your questions? Yeah, and Chief is here, absolutely. No questions. Yes, please, ma'am. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're looking at a couple of different things. And it always, it always briefs well. And, it, you know, we had a company come in and they said, hey, we can do these things and people can learn at their own pace, which the Army, I won't say TRADOC because I don't want to say their name out loud, said, oh, great, then we can make people go faster and they can go to the, the, the force faster. But the different areas that we train, one of the challenges we have is very few people come in a Linux master a Windows master, a networking master, a, you know, and all of the different things. So they're normally good at one thing or maybe two things, but not everything. And normally even those two things aren't contiguous. And so we have options. One of the options is we let people learn at their own pace and they can go faster. The other thing that we've, we've tried to develop, and I'm going to have, have Scott uh, talk a little bit about it, is instead of if you've already achieved the learning objective on day two of a five-day event, how do we give you deeper levels? How do we give you something else where now you say, hey, now I'm being challenged? And how do we recognize you for that? How do we give you recognition for achieving higher levels of learning in those areas? And then maybe even more importantly, something that we're failing at but starting to do a little bit better is how do we identify them when they graduate to the operational force so it's not discovery learning all over again. But you want to talk a little bit like the, sure. the system DDS was doing there or how we're going to different? Uh, yeah, so uh, 
probably over the last year, we've met with a couple companies. So if you think about something like Capture the Flag. So uh, you can do a lot of learning through type Capture the Flag type exercises where uh, the class is supposed to achieve, I don't know, maybe they're supposed to capture the first floor. But then within the system itself, you have an additional 20 for your high performers. So, uh, so as we've revised our Cyber Common Technical course, so one of the things that they've integrated in there is more of a a, uh, a capture the flag type of system. So they've been spending a lot of time investing this really to kind of get after, it's not so much the, uh, the low achievers or even the average achiever, it really is to get after those higher achievers because you don't want them just sitting off to the side bored because they finished in 10 minutes something that you designed thought would take everyone two hours. Uh, so we, we've worked with that. Uh, and kind of one of the interesting things is we've talked to companies we've, is, is there's a lot of really great stuff out there. Uh, but a, but a lot of times is when it, it's not useful for us when we can't own it ourselves. So if we can't if we can't maintain the database, if we can't copy uh, what we're getting from other folks into our own database, or if it's not transferable, because this is something we want to be able to provide to the operating force. So if you have a student that's uh, really gone above and beyond in a very specific area, they they've demonstrated ex exceedingly high quality skills. You want it, It's neat that we can. Hey, hey, this student is really, really smart in this area, but if we can't pass that on to the operational force in some way, we're really kind of losing, uh, we're losing the whole point of it. So we want to, one of the things we're really trying to get after is, to, is, is talent, what, you know, broadly talent management, but we're trying to build this, some type of system where we can track a person from when they come in all the way throughout their entire career. So when we pass them off to the operating force, the operating force can see exactly how it is they're doing, you know, in Windows operating systems. Hey, this guy's really, really awesome, or this guy, uh, they're not so good, maybe their, their talent lies elsewhere. And then when we get them back, so after they've been out in the operating force for three or four years, we can see what the operating force has done with them because then we can start to really kind of tailor their learning. So if, they've, they, if they have a lot of experience, if they have a lot of expertise, then we can really kind of get them to, to target either their weakness or we continue going after because they're an expert in a certain field. We can really, really develop that expertise by letting them have different options that their, their peers, you know, uh, we have a lot of money that we get from TRADOC to buy uh, vouchers to buy, you know, because certification accreditation is big. Uh, so we have a lot of money that we can give to the students who really don't need further training in a certain in a certain block that we're teaching. That we can give them vouchers to go off and do industry standard certifications. So those are some of the things that we're doing. One other thing we do: we also run a monthly constructive course credit review board. And so individuals that we brought in through the voluntary transfer and center program or other methods that have been out in the operational force doing the job, have the CISSP certifications, or have been planning cyber operations, uh, we'll bring in those, pa they'll submit a packet and we'll uh, evaluate it to see if they meet training requirements. So we can get them back to the operational force quicker or not have to bring them here for training at all. And for example, la last Friday we did one of these um, review boards we had 17 packets, I think, in total, saved over four and a half years of training. Between the 17 individuals, that's four and a half years of instructor contact hours that we saved um, by doing that review board. That'll, that'll, that'll uh, you know, scale down as we, you know, keep moving forward and keep bringing in more and more cyber folks ourselves. But uh, uh, it's been a huge value um, assessing the force and um, uh, giving um, training credit and getting folks, the operational folks, quicker. All right, what other questions, please? Sir. We have a great One of you want? So, so you are right. I mean, there is the IDIQ that's coming up. I think um, March of next year, I think, is when they're, they're planning on IDIQ hitting the street. Uh, right now, uh, I mean, contract wise, like, so EW, of course, is the huge growth industry for us. Uh, the cyber piece is much more settled. Uh, that what's the you want to talk about uh, you want to talk about like the, the um, so, so we have so there are, are some contracts that we have that we can expand and so those are ones that we've you know already got partnerships with 
kind of the big, and, and this is where we're on kind of a pause X. So you heard General Furry talk about all this growth. You see us talking about all this growth. The problem is the Army process. So our bumper sticker is our progress is outpacing the process. And so where we sit right now, the Army has not turned on all these EW units. So the Army is being very meticulous. You may read about it in a newspaper somewhere that the Army is being very meticulous of how we turn these on, and we're really linking that to our ability to be able to give them equipment. And so the faster that we can get program of record equipment that we can purchase and have um, targeted for what that equipping schedule is, we will do what the, what the military calls, we'll put effective dates or E-dates on the MTOs that will turn all of the growth on. So if it all turns on as fast as the general officers want, then in fiscal year 21 and 22, we're going to jump up massively from like, um, we're looking at six courses next year, we were supposed to jump up and we could jump up as high as 24 the year after that. The reason why we're hemming and hawing is if it's lower than that, then it, it could fall into some contracts that we already have or would be a new contract that would go through our MIC here on Fort Gordon. But we may hit a threshold that forces us to have to go through the MIC in Fort Eustis, and so you may see it come out there. Um, yeah, unfortunately, our, again, our, proce- our, our progress is outpacing the process. General officers are telling us go faster, and other folks are saying, well, it's not there yet. So when you see those, it'll be announced just like anything else that the Army announces uh, contractual obligations for. But thanks for that question, absolutely. All right, we have a little bit of time for maybe one or two more. Yes, sir. Right. Right. So, e- excellent question. So, so a while ago, the Army created a competitive category for information dominance, and so our cyber warfare, our electronic warfare, and our information operations. Yeah. So, others were where it was it was put out to them if you want to join this so that you get looked at a little bit differently, you can join this. Uh, so far, that's all the takers that we have. That's good and that's bad. So where that's good is a couple of things. Uh, Number one, in the Army board system, when there's a board running, you go through a competitive category and you kind of do a full stop, and then you get briefed on the the different skill sets that are in this next competitive category that you're going to look at. And so since ours look a little bit different, um, the problem is when they're in a big group, you can say that to somebody, but when you're looking at so many packets, you kind of get into this forming a, a, a you know, mental image of who you're looking for. And you're looking for S3s and XOs. And you see that so many times, it's hard to remember 300 people ago when this new 17 comes up that that's different. I need to think differently. So they cr- we've created our own competitive category. That will help, hopefully, when board members hear this is what we're looking for. This is what to expect from career from their careers, and this is what's really important. And this, these are the folks that are highly skilled. If you see them doing this, when they see those packets, they'll they'll compete well. So it won't just be that we're getting enough people promoted. We felt confident that we can do that through other means, but we're getting the right people promoted. The only con from that is we're competing against ourselves. And I think some of our folks would compete really, really well in other boards as well. Uh, they still do all Army at the lower grades. So, yeah, so great question, and we'll see as other things get put into the information warfare, the General Fogarty Circle, we'll see if more you know, kind of fall into that. But thank you for that question. I think you had a question first here, sir, and then I'll go back to you. So that's a great, great question. I'm going to touch on it slightly, and then I'm going to defer you to something. So, so yeah, so the Army is 
looking at how do we do this again. So the Army used to be equipped with, equipped with great electronic warfare capability, and so now we're trying to do it again. But we're not trying to go back to the future because we want to look at, number one, the, the threats are different, the threats are more complicated, and in the old days of I want to jam that, turn on my jammer, and now I'm just, you know, pure radiation of power, which I'd say is kinetic as well. We're just flinging electrons. What you're basically saying is target me. I'm right here. And so we're looking at how do we use more sophisticated modes, derf them in some other ways to be able to, to spoof and do that. Now, I'm going to defer you, however. If you're here through Thursday afternoon and Friday morning, the PEOs will be here. And those are great questions for them. We believe that there will be a consistency of most of the Army in sets and kits. But one of the reasons, as Dr. Smith talked about how we're doing, and as I showed on the slide, where we're getting a lot of into the physics and into the math, because I don't care what the box is if you understand the theory underneath it. And so we're creating our individuals to be able to go out and whatever kit they get, whether it's a tin can, you know, and making their own field expedient antennas, uh, they'll be able to do that, and you'll see that happen. But having said that, the Army's going to have something that's sustainable, repeatable, predictable. And so the PEOs, they're just chomping at the bit for you to ask them that question. Awesome. Yes? Yeah, so that's a great question. The, the short answer is yes. I'm going to turn it over to Sean to give you a little bit more depth than that. Hey, so it, when this is done, if you hit me up afterwards, our office runs that. So currently we have uh, nine trained with industry opportunities, the full-blown uh, year-long PCS moves. Um, not enough. Uh, so to mitigate that, we're looking at a bunch of short-term uh, four- to six-weekers where we've got a couple of those in the hopper right now that we're working. But uh, to your point, uh, absolutely want to pursue those. Um, industry can keep up with technology. Um, Department of Defense and academia traditionally cannot as well. So we will continue to partner with Train with Industry. But uh, going forward, it will probably be more short-term, limited type events, you know, taking 30 people somewhere for two weeks instead of one person somewhere for uh, 12 months. But uh, if you hit me up afterwards, if your company's interested in that, um, Ms. Montrese Love in my office runs our Broadening Opportunity Programs, and I can get you in touch with her. Yeah, so let me hit on the first part. So, yes, we, we, since we stood the school up, we've had a tight uh, coordination with, uh, with USMA. Uh, we have the, the um, Army Cyber Institute that's out there as well. They have the uh, Cyber Leader Development Program. And then we begin to promulgate that as well um, out through, with the help of ACI, out to ROTC. So we're trying to make those two things connect. Um, in some cases, there is some things that are somewhat repetitive because we have such a broad way of coming in. But again, that's where we look at if they come in and you've already got these skills, then how do we use some other methodologies to allow you to deepen that? Uh, we also have a program called an advanced education program uh, where we can take kind of some great skills, if you will, um, assign them uh, to force structure that's going to be set aside specifically for that. The operational force can then nominate very specific projects that will look for those key talents and how do we get you to learn by doing, almost like you, you would do your thesis project. As for the special operations, Sergeant Major. So we're, whoa, hello, good afternoon. So we are developing uh, very similar to what the Intel Center of Excellence is doing called the Quick Start Program. And what we will do is there will be a selection process, an identification process based on the need 
um, from the special operations community. And when they graduate, they will go do a six-month deployment uh, at either at Bragg or DC or downrange um, on the cyber side. We're looking at Bullock, and we're also looking at the 17 Charlie 10 level course. Um, we will eventually fold Echoes into that program, but it will give them the operational experience on the soft side uh, to get that experience up front before they go to their, their first duty assignment. Okay, thank you. I Thank you. I'm glad that I'm making you smile. Hey, from a proponent perspective, a couple other things we're doing with the special operations community. Um, we're engaged with the uh, uh, Special Warfare Center up at Fort Bragg uh, for performance enhancement type stuff. I got a staff psychologist, works in the cyber school. I got her going up there sharing information with them on how we do performance enhancement. And then also over the last um, 12 to 14 months, we've been working with the, uh, the Army Research Institute, which is based out of Fort Benning, Georgia, developing a specific um, aptitude-based test for uh, 75th Ranger Regiment to identify rangers with electronic warfare and cyber propensity. Um, why do we want those uh, young warriors? Because they got grit, they got determination, um, they got a lot of heart. Um, we think they'll make great uh, cyber warriors. They've proven that with electronic warfare over the last four to six years, where they take an 11 Bravo, 15 years, excuse me, CW5 Cardenas that knows a thing or two about USASAC and different uh, special ops uh, corrected me. Um, so yeah, we're, we're engaged with that community. I uh, want to want to leverage them for um, not only uh, training and assessment piece, um, but for uh, recruiting piece into our formation. Um, anytime we can bring a 11 Bravo Ranger over into cyber or electronic warfare, I think that's a win. And um, we, uh, uh, we should be going hot with that assessment test. We're running the pilot right now, the next four to six months. I uh, said, so, you know, maybe next fiscal year sometime we'll start formally assessing those folks and then getting them trained up under their umbrella and then bring them into our umbrella for formal training. Anyone else? Any other questions? No? All right, let me just close with this then. Hey, so... This is kind of my own personal statement, so this does not represent the views, you know. So I'll, I'll tell you that where we're going with our training, where we're going with our career maps, it's exactly wrong. But it's mostly right. And in the past, that wasn't a good answer. You just could not do anything until you had the exact answer. And when things don't change a lot and you can form an assembly line, that works perfectly. But in this environment, you've got, you're, not, you're not changing direction unless you're moving. You're merely just moving in circles. And so we're moving one step at a time, and it's kind of the DevOps model. We're working really, really close with the operational force. We're getting feedback from soldiers. So a novel idea. Our curriculum, a lot of it, is located in a, in a system that's used for software revision control so where people would put code and software, uh, uh, GitLab, if anyone, and, and we're using that for our lessons plans. And so they're loaded there so our operational force can go back and look at them and see what we're doing. And number one, if we've advanced since a soldier has been there and we're doing something slightly differently, they get to take that curriculum they get to go into our virtual training area that they have the credentials to get into. They get to spin up environments and follow that because they're, they can just grab it and drop it and it spins up the environment for them and they can kind of go back and do it again and do it slightly differently. Or if the operational force has ideas for changes like you would do for software revisions in Git, they can go in there and make those deletions and additions and shoot it back to us and just like we would do for software. In fact, that's how we started the school. The former, former chief of staff of the Army lied, and he said, we won't start the school, in, and this is an FY14 until FY16, and in FY15, we had private show, or our lieutenant showing up. And so we had to crowdsource the creation of our, of our lessons plans, and we've never left that. So, yeah, we're doing things, and we're stepping out there, and everything is an experimentation and demonstration that has proven capability. And the things that are good, we look for lessons learned and to replicate. The things that don't work so good, we don't just throw it away. We put it up as a lesson learned, and we store that because it didn't work well the first time. You've got to re, you know, 
do your analysis. Was it too early? Was it the wrong step? You know, all of those things. And this is kind of a community thing. I see Al Smith's got his hand trying to. Sure. Yep. So until I have the bandwidth, until we can, if you need an outlet for that, let me point you to the Georgia Cyber Center within walking distance here which is a great partner. I'm not saying that's, you know, do them instead of us. I'm saying uh, we see the Augusta area, you know, rising tide lifts all ships. And so we really need the support of the local area, and I already see that happening. I see folks with, I'm getting invitations to ribbon cuttings out there in the Georgia Cyber Center. That is awesome, and that will pay dividends because we're already out there. We have a presence out there in the Georgia Cyber Center, so that's the first place to start dumping those things, and this, this machine will just keep turning. 